Let's all stand together. Come on. We're going to worship.
So God, we just want to declare, Lord, that here in this place, God, we welcome you. Our hearts are turned to you. Our eyes are upon you. You said if we agree together, when we come together in your name, there you are in the midst of us. So we thank you that you are here this morning. And we just put you on the throne and in control of this service. Have your way in this place today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome. Hey, turn to the person next to you and say, I don't think I've ever seen so much joy in a person in my life. <laughs> it might be because the anointing's all over you. So we want to welcome everybody here today. You can be seated. We want to welcome all those that are tuning in by live streaming. We love you. We miss you. We really can't wait to see your faces in person. So we love you. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, if this is your first time you've ever been to the road on a Sunday service, raise your hand. Keep them up high. First time you've ever been to the road on a Sunday service. Everybody look around. Everyone... Everyone that did not have their hand raised, I now commission you to be part of the welcoming committee. So, so if, uh, we, if you get a minute, introduce yourselves, these new people. Make them feel loved on. We, we, run, we want everybody that walks through our doors to feel like they, they put on their favorite pair of blue jeans. So welcome. Speaking of new people, next Sunday, we're having our, our Roadmap Newcomers Welcome Luncheon. And in that, you really get to hear from um, Pastor Steve, all the pastors, all the department heads. You get to learn about our values, our mission, our, our vision, and um, get to know a little bit more about the road. If it's a place that you want to make your home, we would love that. But that's next Sunday from 12 to 2. Today is the last day to sign up for it. The last one we had was a couple of months ago. We had the most people we've ever had on a roadmap. It's crazy. Every week I see all these new people, and I, I'm kind of loving it. If I haven't introduced myself to you yet, uh, come and introduce yourself to me if you're new. And I'll try to remember your name, but I got a great memory until I have to use it. So <laughs> welcome. If you go to the information desk after the service, we have a little gift for you. You can find out a little bit more about the road right there, and we can learn a little bit more about you. So welcome to that. Um, we're always looking for opportunities to bless our neighbors and our community. So this year we're doing a Thanksgiving Day outreach, and if you go out of our parking lot, go down Somerset, the park at Briargate Apartments, there's 20 buildings there, 12 apartments each building, so 240 apartments. We're doing a Thanksgiving Day, complete Thanksgiving Day dinner outreach to every one of those families that's interested. Some of them may be going other places for the holidays or have other plans already, but we reached out to them. They're going to get back to us how many are, are interested. But when you came in, you should have gotten one of these flyers. In it, it explains a little bit about the outreach. There's a shopping list on that, on this a little flyer. And you can pick up one of these boxes. They're in the entryway, right when you're coming in the building. Um, as you're going on your way out there to the left, just grab one. You can put all the items in that shopping list in the box. And just return it here by um, November 22nd. That's the Sunday uh, before Thanksgiving, that Tuesday before Thanksgiving, we're going to take these boxes down and, and put some finishing touches on it. We'll have a manila envelope in there with instructions how to cook a turkey because some people might not know. And some, um, some recipes in there, green bean casserole and stuffing. So that will be in there as well. On Tuesday then from 11 to 1, 5 to 7, we're going to drop these off at the, in the lobby there in the rec room kind of at the park at Briargate. And as families pick them up, we're going to love on them and pray for them. So it's our way of blessing our neighbors. So it's a great thing. Um, also coming up here, we have a thing with our youth called Love Life, Live Life. It's a multi-youth group worship night here at the road, November 20th on a Friday night from 6 to 9. Pastor Steve has an anointing, let me tell you, to gather pastors in this region. I mean, uh, when we first shut down, we, let's see, we have 84 pastors at our church um, and, and, but Pastor Ryan's got an anointing with youth pastors and gathering them together. So there's at least five youth um, ministries that are going to take part in this free worship night, November 20th. And guys, this is the stuff that transformation of cities is made of, where there's unity 
God commands a blessing, and the place of unity is always the place of power. So we have a little video that shows you a little bit about this um, um, live life, love life. And so let's watch this, and then Pastor Steve's got the message. Awesome. Good morning, you guys. Y'all okay? We're going to talk in a few minutes about that. Um, listen, I've got an old friend. 1978. Robin, you had already been a believer. But uh, I was really, did you know I was a new believer? I didn't know So that. I was only like a year old. Wow. Anyway, University of Georgia. We were in a discipleship group together, and we got reacquainted a week and a half ago. I hadn't seen each other since 1978. He became a pastor and is in uh, Germantown. Georgetown. Georgetown, South okay. Carolina, with Victory Christian Fellowship. That's it. And this guy never shut down in the midst of the whole COVID thing. So, bro, I just wanted you to share how we can pray for you and how you've right. been doing, man. I've been doing great. I want to say first thank you to Steve and to this wonderful church. I can't tell you how encouraging it is to me and my wife to be among people of like precious faith. You know, Elijah, when he got discouraged and he got tired and he got weary, he complained to God that he was the only one. I tried that. And... Um, the Lord, when we came here, I came two weeks ago. I have two daughters that live here in Colorado, one in Castle Rock, one here in your community. And uh, just out of craziness, she was coming to the Lou Engel prayer thing, and she says, I'm going to a church where Steve Holt is the pastor. I said, Steve Holt, wait, that name sounds familiar. And then I, I said, check and see his bio. And she said he was a gymnast at the University of Georgia, and I said, that's insane. I said... 42 years ago, I had only been a believer for a year and a half. I got involved with Campus Crusade, and this guy became one of my group leaders and taught me how to have a disciple, a devotional life and discipleship, and it has been a part of my life. And so here I am, 37 years into the ministry, and we reconnect. <laughs> and uh, it's awesome. amazing. And so... It was encouraging to be with him. Last week we had uh, lunch with he and his wife, and it was so encouraging. And so I wanted to share with you real quickly just something that was a challenge for me. When um, I had come back from Thailand and this whole COVID thing was cranking up, and something that I believe that I know your pastor does, in order to obey God, you got to hear his voice. And so I went to the Lord, and he gave me two scriptures he gave me one out of Hebrew. Well, two, both of them were in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I love the Passion Translation, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. And uh, Hebrews 10, 25, it says this. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate the day dawning. And so I heard that scripture. He said, go to the end. The Holy Spirit did. And so I read verse 38. My righteous ones will live from my faith, but if fear holds them back, my soul is not content with them. But we are certainly not those who are held back by fear and perish. We are among those who have faith and experience true life. And so the Holy Spirit said, press on. Don't stop. And so I did that. And uh, in our small county there on the coast of South Carolina, we were one of only three churches in the entire county that didn't stop, and we just kept going, kept going, and we've just kept going. And so toward the end of October, yes, toward the end, and toward the end of October now, it got a little bit pressure filled. People got to be complaining, yeah. and just yeah. like you experienced, yeah. we had a COVID outbreak in our church, and so some of our people began to whisper. I just kept pushing. 
And it got a little bit wearisome, and so I said, you know what, yeah. I'm going to go away, and I came here. Wow. And the Lord said this to me. He said, you didn't run from anything. I drew you to something. Hallelujah. I love it. And so I want to say this. I got one more thing, and then I'm going to sit down and let this brother preach. It's important for you to lift up your pastor. It's important for you to pray and push. Every pastor needs the Aaron and hers to lift his hands up during the battle, and we're in a battle and there are great things ahead of us, but there are great challenges ahead of us. And this man is going to carry the weight of that. And he needs your encouragement. He needs your prayers. And so not only do you need to stand with him, but let me tell you to do something that every pastor needs. Email him, text him, and tell him that you love him, that you believe in him, and that you stand with him in this time. And so... So many of you do do that. Thank you. And so I want to close with this thought. The Lord gave me this while I was here. Thomas Aquinas, if the highest aim of a captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in the port forever. It goes on to say, safety should not be our highest aim in life. Playing it safe keeps in the never-ending land of the soulless. Jesus promised that we would suffer and be persecuted. Passion takes us out of the harbor. At sea, we encounter calm, safe, and storms. It is part of the deal. We can't go to where we want to go without setting sail. Leaving the harbor is not safe. Jesus promised us that it will be well worth it. Thank you, Ra. Thank you, brother. Yeah, appreciate Bless you. that. <laughs> and this is Char. This is uh, Rob's wife of 40-some-odd years, right? 42? Yeah, wow. So, would you guys both just stand together? Would all of you just extend your hands to this precious couple? And God, I just want to thank you so much for Rob and Char and who they are and this reacquainting, this, this, this coming together again after all these years. And God, we just bless Victory Christian Fellowship. And we pray that that ministry in Georgetown would be powerful and used mightily by you. Encourage them during this, this time where it's been really hard with the COVID situation. And I pray for divine healing over the people of Victory Christian Fellowship in a whole new way and a whole new level of faith and trust in you through this. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. How are you guys doing? Whoa. Okay. I like it. Been a rough week. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say honestly that it's been a rough week. I certainly didn't expect what we've come across over this past week. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician, and I don't have inside scoop with President Trump's administration. So my faith is not shaken. My faith is the unshakable kingdom. Presidents will come and go, and all the machinations that are involved with the situation, with the vote count, and whether there's voter fraud is not an area I know anything about except what we can see on the, the news or on Twitter accounts. But here's what I know is that we can pray. And there's power in prayer. And this is a praying church. That's why I put this back up in here, the first prayer in Congress. And we, we would be sinful if we didn't pray. Because there's demonic spirits trying to take over this country. And it's only going to through, be through Jesus followers like you in this room that we see the kingdom of God come. 
We are commanded by Jesus to pray our Father who art in heaven. Let's stand right now. I'm in fasting and prayer personally, starting yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I'm calling for a day of fasting and prayer tomorrow for the church. The sanctuary will be open. My wife wants people to bring candles and light them across the stage here or in front of the cross. And there's candles over there you can light. And to come anytime during the day tomorrow to pray for our nation. So I don't know how early, maybe 8 a.m. on till 5 or 6, we, the, 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 this will be open. And you're welcome to come and kneel down or go prostrate before the Lord or pray or stay or worship as long as you want. This is your sanctuary. This is the people's sanctuary of prayer for our nation. And then we called for 52 days of prayer. As we went through Nehemiah, which we're in today. And that ends up on Friday. And people ask me, well, why didn't we end it at the, at the election? Now, they asked me that before. I think we know why now. And for you that are online watching, this sanctuary is for you too. You're welcome to come. But at noonday prayer, Monday through Friday, all day fasting and prayer tomorrow if you want to join us till, till the evening tomorrow. The invite is to all of us to cry out to God. God always answers prayer. Now, he doesn't always answer the way we want him to. But we do the best we can with the knowledge that we have to pray according to his will. And the great prayer of all is the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray that together right now. Let's pray that with our country in mind. So this is not your prayer to the Lord. This is our prayer as a church for our country. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. You believe that? All right, take your Bibles. Let's hold them up. And let's proclaim and declare to the Lord what we believe to be true. That I'm growing, I'm growing to love Jesus with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm growing to love Jesus with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm growing to love people the way Jesus loves them. I'm building up my faith with God's holy word. I'm coming alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. And with Jesus, all things are possible. With Jesus, I can move mountains in my life. With Jesus, I can walk in freedom and joy and purpose. No matter what my circumstances are. When I walk by faith, my feelings follow. I don't follow my feelings. I follow Jesus. And I have faith in him. And he's still on the throne. And he's not up for re-election. Amen? All right, you can be seated. Well, church, I, um, like I've said so many times before, the whole family, all we talk about is politics and religion. So it hasn't been exact. Well, you know what I should say? Our, our, we have a happy family, even on a bad day, even when things happen like what we're experiencing right now. 
But man, you get in our hot tub, and I mean, it's hot. And I, we were, we get into it. We were into it last night. And uh, let me just say this about what we were talking about, and I'll just pass this on to you, whatever it's worth. It's not worth anything to you. Don't worry about it. But um, I, think it's, I think it's too early to quit. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up as a PK. So I, I grew up as a middle-class kid in Stone Mountain, Georgia. All right? So I had an aluminum spoon. I was born with an aluminum spoon in my mouth. All right? So I had to work for everything I got. How many of you have had to work for almost everything you've got? All right. You're my kind of people. So when you hear about people in the White House telling the president he should just give up, acquiesce, I think, wow, there's a lot of silver-spooned kids in the White House. You battle. And then when there's nothing more you do, then you, not unlike David, with that child that he had with Bathsheba, and he fasted, and he prayed, and he battled before the Lord for seven days, and the baby died. And then what did he do? He got up, he cleaned himself off, and he went on with life. But until the baby dies, he's battling. And so come tomorrow, battle in prayer with us. That people who are involved with whatever's going on, would discover things or not discover things. Because here's what the scriptures say. Daniel 2, 20. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. And He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and He raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He, listen, he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. That's what we're asking. God, if there's stuff in darkness that needs to be revealed, be revealed. We're going to cry out for that. You're the God of light. But then when our time is up, and it's over, either whatever direction it takes. We rejoice. We have no regrets. We've given it all. All right? It's all right. It's, it's, it's all right. So turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah. We're going to go back to Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, the, the chapter we have is super long. So I'm going to move quickly through it. The theme today, if you're taking notes, is revival and the restoration of worship. Revival and the restoration of worship. God chose in His sovereign plan that we'd be in chapter 8 last week and chapter 9 this week, right as we come into this election time. There was no strategy on my part. It was just, we're going through Nehemiah because we're rebuilding walls, and we believe God wants to rebuild walls in our country. God wants to rebuild walls in your life, and that takes effort. It takes effort to rebuild walls in your life. Every one of us, every one of us have walls in our life that need to be rebuilt and restored, amen? Amen. We all have those areas of our life that God wants to come and He wants to bring a revival. He wants to bring restoration. So last week, we looked at the fact that God used the preached Word. That when the Word was preached, revival happened in the hearts of the people. And this, there's no greater two chapters in all of the Bible about revival and restoration than Nehemiah 8 and 9. So we're picking it up now because here's what happens is when, when God begins to restore your heart, what he restores first is worship. 
He, when, when you learn to repent, when you begin to give God those areas of your life that you know aren't from Him, you know that you're in rebellion in, in, in your life, and you, and you repent of that, you give it to Him, the first thing that begins to happen in your life is you have a, a passion for the Word and a passion for worship. It's exactly what happens here. So look at it in verse 1. So we're in chapter 9. Look at this restoration of worship that occurs. Let me just, before I go into that, let me just say this. Chapter 9 is about the restoration of worship and it's about the character of God. In other words, when you worship, what are you worshiping? I can tell you one thing. When I first saw this, I was... I was focused on her outward beauty. I didn't know her heart. I didn't know her walk with God. I just saw her. We were smuggling Bibles in China. And when I saw her, I zeroed in on that little blonde from UCLA. So we see something when we begin to focus. And what we're going to see is a focused attention that begins to happen, which we're going to call worship to the King of Kings. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. That's why I'm calling, that's part of why I'm calling tomorrow for fasting and prayer. There's something about fasting that focuses you. Some of you in this room need to learn the power of fasting. That there's things in your life that are not going to get broken off until you fast and pray about it. And I don't know what it is, but there's something supernatural about when you give up what's a basic necessity of your life, which is food, in order to feast not on food, but on God, that somehow seems to get God's attention toward you and answers prayers more quickly. So they come together, they're fasting. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from the foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day. And for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. So they come, they, they repent. Men and women, the signature of a revival, the signature of a move of God is always repentance. When God... I mean, think about it. How hard is it in your life to admit you're wrong? If you, have any, if you have any thought about the fact that it's easy, ask your spouse if you're married. Ask your roommate if you're not. It's hard, right? It's hard to admit you're wrong. And repentance is admitting you're wrong. It's admitting you've made mistakes. It's admitting that you're going in the wrong direction and that you need to change direction and go back toward God. That is not easy. That is supernatural when somebody really repents. So there's a supernatural work of the Spirit. Now when repentance occurs, it opens you up to a new relationship with God in a whole new way, and I'm calling it the restoration of worship. The restoration of worship. Look at verse 4. Why the thing about Nehemiah is all these names. Yeshua, Bonnie, Cadmiel, Shabaniah, Booney. Now that sounds like a southern name. That sounds like somebody from the Appalachians, bro. That, this is my boy. His, this is Booney. Booney over here. Sherebiah, Bonnie, Shanani stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice, the Lord their God. And the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bonnie, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hadijah, Shabaniah, and Pathiah said. All right, I think I deserve some applause for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. All right, now look at this. This is your definition of worship. Write in your Bibles, definition of worship. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Men and women, worship is blessing God. 
It's not you getting a blessing, it's Him getting the blessing. And that, in other words, it's not just singing songs. It's not singing hymns or praise songs. It's how you live. In other words, if you're blessing God by having a life of integrity, if you're blessing God with how you handle your finances, if you're blessing God by saying no to an immoral relationship, if you're blessing God by telling the truth and being honest, that's worship. Folks, that's worship. That's the life of worship. Worship is blessing God. And look at what he says next, verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The hosts of heaven worship you. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, the direction of worship is heaven. The definition of worship is blessing. And when you bless heaven, when you bless the God of heaven, you're lining yourselves up with what's already happening in heaven. So when you come to my house and you come to my living room, it's set up a certain way. Like when, when you walk in from the front door, you guys have been there before, you know, like there's a couch right here and there's two chairs over there. We got the fireplace over there. Anybody walking in as a guest, if, you know, being courteous and mannerly might think now where am I supposed to sit because Steve sits somewhere and I don't want to sit in Steve's place and so you kind of you're a little worried right because that's my living room I, I run my living room well heaven is God's living room he loves his living room and it's 24 7 worship Revelation 4 and 5 is 24-7 worship. So when you direct your worship to Him, what we're doing, men and women, is we're lining ourselves up with what's already happening up there. So when you start to take your eyes off election, take your eyes off Trump, take your eyes off Biden, take your eyes off whatever, and we, and we direct them up, and we begin to worship Him, we're lining ourselves up with all the resources of heaven. That's pretty good news, right? Say that's good news. You're lining yourselves up with what's happening in heaven, and He has the access point now to pour into your heart that which you're missing, which is causing you to grieve, causing you to be frustrated, causing you to be worried, because what's happening is when you take your eyes off your circumstances and put your, and put your heart and your mind on Christ, then God now has access to your heart, and when he has access to your heart, he gets your spirit man, and when he gets your spirit man, you get set free. Because that's the presence of God. That's what's happening here. He's saying to the Jews, quit weeping. You've repented enough. Take your eyes off your circumstances and all the obstacles. Remember, they're, they're still in bondage here. They're still under a foreign power. So you know what I did two days ago? I picked up Eric Metaxas' book on Bonhoeffer to read it again. Third time. Everybody know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was? All right. Maybe half of you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor under the regime of Adolf Hitler who started and developed the confessing church against Hitler. And Eric Metaxas, if you've ever watched any of his podcasts, are awesome. He's fantastic. Anyway, he wrote this seminal work on Bonhoeffer, about that thick. And I was reading it because I'm looking at the lay of our land, and I'm saying, you know, Bonhoeffer found joy under Hitler. I can certainly find joy in the midst of an election that I disagree with. Hello? You can too. But what I see happening in Nehemiah is Ezra saying to them, Guys, quit focusing on your bondage and your mistakes and your sin. Would you now take your eyes off of that? Put your eyes on me, worship me, trust me, and I'm going to pour my resources into you. And so here in the rest of the chapter, and it's a long, long chapter, I'm going to do the best that I can. We see the, these character qualities, God, I want to give you seven. I'm going to give you seven character qualities that they 
fill their mind with in worship to God. Starting at verse 7. So I'm going to go really quickly through these. And listen. I want you to listen. All right, listen, guys. Don't be, don't let the, the worries of what's happening right now burden you. Take notes. Write these down. Don't miss this. These are beautiful. These speak to who God still is. He's the same as he was then as he is here. You are the Lord God, verse 7, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham and found his heart faithful before you. And you made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, to give it to his descendants, you have performed your words, for you are righteous. Number one character quality is that we have a covenant-keeping God, men and women. We have a covenant-keeping God. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means exalted father of a multitude. Listen to me. God wants to multiply his dominion in your heart. He really does. He doesn't want you just to be an exalted father. He wants you to be an exalted father of multitudes. In other words, he's looking for a multiplication ministry in all of your lives. If you're a mom, you're called by God to something that is going to have an impact on your family. You as fathers to have an impact on your families, in your job, with your finances. God doesn't want you just for you, he wants you to multiply out to make an impact on others with the kingdom of God. So tomorrow, that day we come. I don't believe God's done with America yet. I believe there's great days ahead for America. I believe he wants to multiply that which we have to other nations. But we are definitely... In an adjustment period. Hello? It's an adjustment period. And it may not be easy. But some of you in this room, you need to run for office. Some of you in this room need to start thinking bigger than you thought before. Your life's not just for you, but God's going to use you in this community. We're going to do those turkey dinners for these apartments over here, because we want to multiply the kingdom into those apartments. Because God has created us to have dominion. And what I mean by dominion, I don't, I'm not talking about dominion theology as it's sometimes exalted in ways that are, that are in, inappropriate. But I'm talking about the dominion of Genesis 1, 28. The God gives us dominion to come and push back darkness. And every one of you have that anointing because you have the Holy Spirit live within you. So he took Abram, who's just a pagan idolater, and he turns him into a man of God that brought forth the nation of Israel. And we've been given, church, we've been given that same gift as Abraham. I'm having trouble sometimes because I have to hold this mic. I'm not used to that. I got all my notes everywhere. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Galatians 3. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now this is the part I don't, I don't want you to miss this. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promises of the Spirit through faith. So Abraham obeyed God. He walked by faith. God multiplied his faith out. And that, those promises of Scripture are yours. They are mine. They are ours. And therefore, even our country 
today, men and women. God wants to see the abundance of his blessings poured out through believing people. Some of you in this room have a mountain to climb. Some of you in this room have a mountain to climb, and there's a promise at the other end. And you have not been willing to take that step. And Abram was called to take his son Isaac up to that mountain to, to slay him. And God's calling some of us to surrender things to him so that the abundance of his blessing can be released over your life. I want to challenge you today that you are of the lineage of Abraham. And to take those steps of faith and to climb that mountain will not be easy, but it only happens through worship. And we're going to go into worship in a few minutes. And when we go into worship, we're going we're to take our eyes off ourselves, aren't we? We're going to take our eyes off our circumstances. And we're going to lift our hearts up to him. Verse 9. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. And you heard their cry by the Red Sea. Secondly, we have a prayer hearing God. God hears our cries to him. And he wants to bring forth miracles in our life. And church, I'm just saying again, that as we begin to worship him, as we begin to exalt him with our lives. Thank you, brother. Can you unscrew it too? I only have one hand. <laughs> All right, thanks. God increases our faith. God increases our faith. That increase of faith is what parts sees in our lives. Verse 13. You came down also on Mount Sinai, and you spoke with them from heaven and you gave them the just ordinances and true laws and good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. Thirdly, God speaks to us. God speaks to us. In church, God speaks mainly through the word. Love, visions, and dreams. Love, visions, and dreams. God's led us in almost all the major decisions that my wife and I have made have been through visions and dreams, but it was always based in the foundation of God's Word. So it's in God's Word that He builds up our faith. He's a, he's a speaking God. He's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, working through the Word in our hearts and in our lives. He continues, You gave them bread from heaven, for their hunger, you brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. Generous God. A generous God. Because we struggle, don't we, with rebellion. Look at verse 16. But they and our fathers acted proudly and they hardened their necks. They did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey. And they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks. And in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Fifthly, a gracious and merciful God. Some of you here this morning have been running from God. You've been running from God and you've been rebellious to God. And the gracious and loving and merciful God is calling you home. It's time to come home. Come back to Him. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants your heart. He wants the things that you're carrying. He wants you to give it to Him. To carry, to continue to carry the burdens you're carrying is only going to lead to addictions and depression and despair. Will you not surrender it all to Him today? Give it to Him. He's gracious, he's loving, he 
He's a covenant-keeping God. Verse 20. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothing did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Now, I'm a, I'm a Calvinist with a seatbelt on. Um, there's a lot about Armenianism, Calvinism, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, that we don't understand. I am so okay with mystery. I say that as a, as a preamble to this. I don't believe it was God's will, according to this and countless other passages in the Old Testament, that Israel was supposed to be set free from Egypt, come to the Red Sea, call out to God. He opens up the Red Sea. They come through. Pharaoh's army gets drowned. They come all the way to the promised land and then just leave them there for 40 years. But because of their lack of faith and because of their fear of what they were going to have to deal with to enter the promised land, God gave them what they wanted. Now, I don't believe things are done yet. But I will say if next week the election results are the same. And if, and if Trump has given in to the, the election results. We get what we deserve as a nation. But you know what? I don't have to get what the nation deserves on me. We may deserve something nationally, but in my heart, I want to walk and I want to possess the promises of God for my life. How about you? So it doesn't matter to me in one sense. I'm responsible for the whole family. I'm responsible for this church. I'm responsible to a certain extent for this city, and so are you. And I would rather be under the abundance and the blessings of God than the discipline of the Lord. And that's my choice. And so what happened is they came to the promised land. They couldn't take the promised land. They said that, oh, these, they're giants in the land. And we were like grasshoppers to them. And that's why when Moses sent the second group in 40 years later, he said, can you not make any pronouncements to the whole crowd just come talk to me first. Man, I want to walk in that kind of faith. How about you? We can. He's a promise keeping. He's a covenant keeping. He's a Holy Spirit empowering Father. Now look at verse 22. Because this, this is where God wants it to go. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sihon and the land of the king of Heshbon and the land of Og, the king of Bashan. You also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land. And he goes on and on with all these possessions. Men and women, you are called to possess your land. That's you. That's your spirit man. God wants to possess those lusts in your life and that greed in your life and that struggle with anger. That's what God does. He possesses these areas of our heart that he might take possession of our lives. And as we journey with him, we are taking back that ground and we are rebuilding the walls. And he wants to rebuild those walls in your life. Isn't that exciting? All you parents out there with kids in your arms right now. Love it. Even when they're screaming, it's okay. No, it really is. Do you guys realize at Pentecost, they had childcare. 
They went, the 120 were up in the upper room. There were no kids there. It was just quiet. Holy Spirit fell over. Oh! I bet there were screaming kids and all kinds of family stuff going on. God showed up. God loves it. I love it. You should love it. God loves abundance. God loves noise. God loves loud kids. I like kids running through this church and, and doing what they do. Because this is their church, and I want them to love this church because I didn't like church when I was a kid, and so I want kids to like church here. I had to wear my little bow tie and my little clip tie, and oh, I hated it, and it was like the worst, and I would fall asleep, and you guys remember any of that? You remember that coming up in the main kind of mainline churches and stuff? No, man, let's be happy. Let's walk in joy and abundance, and that's what he's talking about here. He's saying he's a kingdom-possessing God, and church, he wants to possess your kingdom, and it's a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong journey. It, it's, it's, that, it's two steps forward and one step back. We still struggle with anger. We still, anybody frustrated over the, this past week? Anybody a little depressed? I was. Someone came up to me and they were, they were really mad in the first service. And, he just, and I said, dude, I love it. I'm glad you care enough about our country that it makes you mad. But let's turn it around and let's possess our own kingdom by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and overcoming our circumstances, not letting our circumstances overcome us. Amen? All right, let's stand. Good job, bro, having the mic back here ready to go. We had some issues on Wednesday night. Listen, on Wednesday night, everyone, we're going to have, I'm going to be talking on the power of the sword, government, the Bible, God, and the power of the sword. And we're going to pray and we're going to trust God again on, on Wednesday night. So this is a big week. This is a week of prayer. Everybody say week of prayer. Week of prayer. We're going to fight, okay? So tomorrow... Sanctuary is open. Come in anytime you want to come. Light a candle. Candles are over there. You can bring your own candle. We're going to line it here. We're going to pray for our country. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, noonday. Again, in here, we're going to pray. Wednesday night, we're going to pray from about 6 to 7.30. You're all welcome. And then we're done. 52 days. We gave it our best. It's a good feeling. No regrets. Say no regrets. Yeah, no regrets. So God, we bless you and praise you here. We take our eyes off ourselves and we bless you in worship. So let's bless the Lord. Duh.
miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God.
Come on, can we just take a minute right now all over this room? Close your eyes, slip your hands in the air. We just say, Lord, here we are. Our hearts are open. Our, our hands are surrendered. Lord, our eyes are fixed upon you. I'm just reminded of what Joshua said to the, to the Lord of heaven's host. He said, whose side are you on? Ours or our enemies? And the Lord looked back at him and he said, neither. I'm on God's side. So we are saying, Lord, that we are, we are partnering with you. We're not Democrats or Republicans. We are kingdom people. And we are saying, you are the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So we're going to declare your preeminence. We're going to declare your sovereignty as the ruler of heaven and earth, the ruler over nations. Come on, all hail King Jesus.
Father God, we just claim that you are a miracle-working God. God, we believe that you're a way maker, miracle worker, and promise keeper. We trust you, Lord, with what's happening in our nation and what's happening in our individual lives. We are going to claim by faith that you are so in control that you are doing things that we have no idea about right now but we are going to do our part in praying believing and trusting so that we have no regrets before you we bless you and we praise you Lord in your most holy and precious name and everybody said you remember how to do it Amen. Woo, you got it. All right. Be blessed. You guys, we'll see you. If you can come tomorrow for prayer, we'll be your noonday prayer all week. If not, we'll see you.